uh, with this series uh, that we have begun and that God will truly speak to us and continue to challenge us and continue to grow us in His Word. Father, thank you for Pastor Box and also uh, the many, many months of investment that he has put into serving us as a congregation. Thank you for the mantle of leadership that you placed over him, uh, that he has led us throughout the time from the time this church was planted. Thank you for his readiness to serve you. Thank you for his readiness to serve your people. Thank you for his desire to express to us the full counsel of the word of God. And today as he shares with us God's word, we want to speak your blessing upon him. We are to ask that his mouth will be your mouthpiece and that your word will come out clear towards your people and towards the destiny that you have for us as a church. We thank you and we praise you for in Jesus' name. Amen. And thank you so much, Pastor Nick, and the core team, and all of you for yeah, supporting the ministries that we do and allowing us to be a church and to enable all that you see here to happen. And we'll really miss Pastor Eugenie for sure. He's been a, a huge part of our team, of our fellowship, of our congregation from the very beginning. And, and I mean, I remember we were commissioned in January, and from then up until now, he's been a, a huge aspect of our team, and we'll, we'll miss him a lot. We wish you all the best as you return to Gong Road, as you serve the prison ministry and elsewhere. And we, we pray that God will go with you, God will bless you as a family. And we look forward to any time you're able to be, be around us here. So, yeah, go well. So good morning everyone, it's great to see all of you. I, I hope you've enjoyed the sermon series this month as much as I have. And I think you've gotten kind of a, a brief earlier from Rose and from Fred, but basically what we're doing this month is we're using the analogy of, of a four course meal to explain the process of how we study the Bible. And so we're calling this series Bon Appetit because we want to invite you to be reading and studying the Bible at a deeper level. And so I know some of you may not have had a four-course meal the way Rose described, but as she mentioned, the, the, the breakdown of those, and I have a, a demonstration here, is the first meal, the first course, is an appetizer. And that represents the process of reading. And for many of us, as we noted when we, when we did week one, we don't go much beyond the appetizer. So we might take a bite, we might have that, like this samosa here. And that's it. So we read the Bible, but we never seek to understand it, we never explain it, we never actually apply it. And then after that, we have our second course. And our second course is what we did last week. And our second course is our salad. And so that's one that, you know, we, we noticed last week, we mentioned last week, we may not enjoy it as much, it may not be the most exciting, the most interesting, but it's something that gives us the vitamins, as Rose said, it gives us the nutrients, and that's the step of understanding what exactly the passage is saying. So I'll just take one bite of lettuce here. That's our salad. So that's what we did last week. And we looked at six questions. We looked at questions of what do the words mean, we looked at what the, the context of a passage is, we looked at the genre, what kind of passage it is, we looked at the setting, we looked at the purpose, and those are all the questions that we look at so that we understand exactly what a passage is saying, and that we, dis we, we describe that clearly. And then after that, after we've done the reading, after we've read it through carefully, we've looked at different translations, we've tried to understand the nuances and the details, the background, the words, the structure of the passage, and so on. After that is when we get to the main course. And, and, and I have here just a, a representation, some, some fish, a bit, of, a bit of rice. So when we take that, we've now come to the main aspect of reading and explaining what the Bible is telling us. I'll just take a comfort. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what we're looking at today. Our main course. And that's the process of explaining what a passage is saying. And so that's what, we, what we've been about. And so the passage we've looked at throughout this month as an example of applying these steps to a passage of Scripture is Philippians. And we've been looking at Philippians chapter 2. 
And one of the things we've been doing is we looked at a video that went through uh, Philippians, the whole book, and did an overview. And we're going to finish that video. If it's ready, I'll ask Jeremy to play that for us. And we'll finish the last third of, of the video. It looks at chapter 3 and chapter 4. And then we'll get into our passage for today. Oh, yes. Then demanding circumcision of non-Jewish Christians. Remember his letter to the Galatians. These people are still stirring up trouble for Paul, and they keep reminding him of his own past. When he used to persecute Jesus' followers, when he tried to show his right standing before God by his zealous obedience to the laws of the Torah. But like Jesus, Paul has given up all of that status and privilege. He now regards all of it as filth. And the word he uses is actually much less polite. He's given it all up to become a servant, like Jesus, to participate in his suffering and sacrificial love. And he does all of it in the hope that Jesus' love will carry him through death and out the other side into resurrection. So Paul says that for followers of Jesus, their true citizenship is in heaven. Which for Paul does not mean that we should all hope to get away from earth and go to heaven one day. Rather, Heaven is the transcendent place where Jesus reigns as king. And he says we're eagerly awaiting our royal savior to come from there and return here to bring his kingdom of healing justice and transforming love to bring about a new creation. Paul then challenges the Philippians to keep living out the Jesus story. He first addresses two prominent women leaders in the church who worked alongside Paul, and they're in some kind of conflict. And so Paul pleads with them to follow Jesus' example of humility, to reconcile and become unified. Paul then urges the Philippians not to give in to fear, but despite their persecution, to vent all of their emotion and their needs to God, who will give them peace. And that peace, Paul says, it comes by focusing your thoughts on what is good and true and lovely. There's always something that you can complain about. But a follower of Jesus knows that all of life is a gift and can choose to see beauty and grace in any life circumstance. Which leads Paul to his conclusion. He again thanks the Philippians for their sacrificial gift, and he wants them to know that his imprisonments, that his times of poverty, that these are not true hardships for him. They've actually become his greatest teachers, showing him that no matter his circumstances, he has learned the secret of contentment. It's simple dependence on the one who strengthens him. Paul has come to see his own suffering as a participation in the story of Jesus. The letter to the Philippians gives us a unique window into Paul's own heart and mind. He saw his entire life as a reenactment of the story of Jesus. And you can sense in this letter his close connection to Jesus, his awareness that Jesus' love and presence is closer than his own skin. And that's what gave him hope and humility in his darkest Hours. And so Paul shows us that knowing Jesus is always a deeply personal, transforming encounter. That's the kind of Jesus that Paul invites others to follow. And that's what Paul's letter to the Philippians is all about. So if you're interested in watching the whole thing, you can look up the Bible Project and what they've done in Philippians. And they've done that for a number of other books. And they just give an overview and kind of an outline of the major themes and the major sections. Philippians. So please turn with me to our passage for this month that we're looking at today, Philippians chapter 2. I'm going to read from verses 12 to 16. And those are the four verses that we've chosen to use to illustrate these steps of how we read and, and study and apply the Bible. So Philippians chapter 2, I'll, I'll start from verse 12 up to verse 16. So verse 12 says this. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill His good purpose. Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. And then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. So today what we're doing, we're looking at, we're explaining what the passage means. 
And to do that, there are four questions we're going to look at during our time. And I think we, we have a, a representative of that that we can put up. But the first question is to ask ourselves, what is the main point of this passage? How can we put it in one sentence? And we're going to go through that. The second question we'll look at is, how does this passage fit into the, the larger message of the Bible, the overall message of the Bible? The third question that we'll touch on briefly is, how does the passage compare with other Bible passages? What do other verses say about this theme? How can we compare them to, to read into and to understand this one? And the final one we'll look at is, what general principles or theological truths does the passage set forth? And, and that's what we're looking at today. And we'll be building on what we did last week, the word we did with the background, the words, and so on. And so, when I go about this, when I look at a passage and I'm trying to understand the main point, I'm trying to, to summarize it and to, and to put it into one sentence, the first thing I do is look at the themes of any passage. And so when I, when I read this passage, the themes that jump out at me are issues of salvation, you know, how our work compares with God's work, how we can live without complaining, how we can shine like stars, and how at the end of the day we can say that our work and our labor was not in vain. Those are some of the themes that, that I see in this passage. So when we come up with our with our main one, our main point, it should ident it should address those themes and bring them into a clear, cohesive idea. And we looked at some of the words last week, but I didn't mention something. And one of the things I didn't mention was that the verbs in this passage are plural. They're actually commands in the plural, which in English can be hard to put across because there's no official way to communicate second person plural in English. Well, you know, if you're from the, south, the <coughs> southern part of the US, there actually is a way that they do it, and, and I'm not from the south. But let me see if I can do that. And, and for them, it would be said, you know, it's great to see y'all here. Yeah. Praise the Lord y'all made it, and next Sunday y'all have to come back. <laughs> yeah? And as so if it was Paul communicating that, he might say, y'all work out your salvation in fear and trembling. Not each one of y'all, but all y'all, because it has to be together. It has to be all of us. So when it just says work out, we don't get the idea that it's plural. There is a way to put it as a singular, but he didn't do that. When he's speaking to the Philippians, he's saying that we have to work out our salvation as a community, that we have to do it together, corporately, and that that's what, what he's communicating to them, and that's what we're looking at. When you look at chapter Chapter 2, the whole of it, we read it, um, I think last week, we read, you know, up to from verses 1 to 16. And if you do that, you see the progression from being united with Christ at the beginning of the chapter to the humble nature of Christ towards, you know, verses 7 and 8, the exaltation of Christ, verses 9, 10, and 11, and then to our, to, to Christ's exaltation after that, sorry, and then to our salvation, and from there to our position as light to our position as pure that we receive as part of our salvation. You see that progression and the way that we mirror the humiliation and the, the humility of Christ, but also the exaltation of Christ. That that's the same journey that we're on. So at the end of the day, we reach the position of being pure, of being upright, and of shining in the world. So this is how I've summarized this passage, these four verses. As I've looked through it, the way, the sentence I've come up with is this, that as we work out our salvation, we must live in harmony, resulting in lives of light and purity. And, and, and I think we have that here, don't we? As we work out our salvation, we must live in harmony, resulting in lives of light and purity. That's why I would summarize these four verses in one sense. That's the main point. And I want to, to, to walk through this a little bit to see what each section looks like. And so the, we'll start with the first part. As we work out our salvation. What we see from this passage, what Paul's telling us, is that salvation is both a gift and a task. And that it can never become only one. It can't be just a gift and we don't do anything. And it can't be just a task where we're just working. But, you know, it, it's really our work, it's really something we earn, something we deserve. We have to keep both of them at the same time. And we can never overwhelm one to the detriment of the other. And I want to give you an analogy to illustrate this. I want you to imagine with me that I want to give you a house. 
house. And so the way I do that, I go out and I buy land from you. I pay it in full. I get the title deed. So I come to you, I give you the title deed. And then I get all that you need to build the house. So I get the stones, I get the wood, I get the, the finishing, the furnishing, the pipes, the wires, everything, the roofing supplies. All of it is there. It's been delivered to the land. It's been laid out neatly. I have the blueprint of how it all goes together. I have the building permits. And I come and I give all of those to you. So then I, I, I take you to the new land that you have in your name. You have your title deed. You have your permits. You have your blueprint. And all the, the equipment, all the supplies that are required are there on site. Are you ready to move in? If you wanted to stay there that night, would you be ready? And you wouldn't be, would you? Because it's not been built. There's, there's no structure. There'd be no safety. There'd be, if it rains, you'd just get wet. You'd just be nearly open. And so you have to do the work of building that house, don't you? In this scenario. You have to put together all the stones. You have to lay them out in the right order. You have to put down the foundation, build the walls, put in the furniture, put in the pipes. You have to do all of that work. And it's very difficult, ongoing work. It would take some time for you to build that house. But if I ask you, did you buy this house? Did you, did you pay for it? You would say no. And if you wanted to pay for it, even if you felt like, you know, you know maybe, maybe I should try and, and pay something, you couldn't, could you? Because there's no one for you to pay. And, and in this scenario, even if you wanted to, could never get enough money to cover the cost of the land, the cost of the supplies, the cost of the permits, and all the other costs that go into it. And there's no one you can pay it to because everyone has been paid. The previous owner has been paid in full. He wouldn't accept anything else. He has the full value of the land. So that's what God has done for us. He's purchased all that we need. He's purchased the land that we need, the supplies that we need. And imagine with me that it's not just a house, but there's also a church structure a community, a fellowship that we're building. So we still have to do the work of building, but it's a gift to us. We don't need to source the supplies. We don't need to you know, come up with funding for, for the land and so on. God has given us our salvation. He's given us our community. But we have to build it. We have to do the work of putting it together. But God has already prepared everything. So something else that we can learn from this passage is that we can't work out what God has at first worked in. He asked us to work out our salvation. He commanded us that all of us, all y'all, would work out your salvation. But the reason we can do it is because God worked in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So God's work has to come first. And after that comes our work. So if someone comes and tells you, you know, salvation is a gift, that's true. But if they tell you there's nothing you need to do, God gives it to you, it's done, you're good to go, that is not true, is it? And Paul makes it very clear that salvation is, requires work. And that all of us together have to work out our salvation with fear and tremble because of what God has done. So that means that this is primarily not about conversion. It's not about the initial moment of being declared right by God. <coughs> innocent, free from guilt, having our sins paid. But it's really about the ongoing journey of walking with God, of growing in faith, what we call sanctification. And that's really what our passage is focusing on here. So we've seen, as we work out our salvation, we've unpacked that a little bit, but as we work out our salvation, we must live in harmony. We must live in harmony. And Paul says to do all things without grumbling and complaining. And again, it's plural. All y'all do all things without grumbling or complaining. And that that's what results in being lights in the world, of being blameless and pure before God. And when, when we grumble and complain, we looked at this a little bit last week, the aspect of murmuring, of secret talk, which is what that word is getting at. It doesn't primarily affect us. It does affect us, but it, it, it primarily affects others. And it kills the community. And I think the main problem for us here as parent is it comes the deeper you go. And so the more involved, if you're a member of our, of our core team, some of the, the members that you saw up here, appreciate Pastor Jenny. If you're a member of our ushering team, of our hospitality team, the more invested you are, the deeper you go, the more likely 
you are to have those challenges that will lead to the grumbling, the arguing, the complaining, and the murmuring. And I know that, that that's a challenge for us. And I know that in some of our teams as we work together, we have disagreements, we have challenges, and that's okay. Disagreements and, and, and conflict is natural. But the question is, what do we do about it? The question is, do we go to someone else and you know, tell them what's happening? Do we go to the person we're having an issue with? How do we deal with the problems that come up in our community? As we're working together and someone doesn't seem to be working with the team, someone else has their own idea, someone else is trying to take over you know, in this project, those are the challenges that we'll have as we move forward. And they'll only get harder as we go on. And, and you know, hope also as we continue to hear from God, to work together, to pray together, I do, I, I do, I do believe there are, there are aspects in which we, we grow in maturity and so on. But as we go on as a church, it doesn't mean that it's easy. We still have the challenges of how we live together in, in harmony. And that's what Paul is addressing here. And he gives a very clear command, do everything without grumbling or complaining. Very clearly. And then we come to the last part of our, of our point. So we said, as we work out our salvation, we must live in harmony, resulting in lives of light and purity. In lives of light and purity. And we looked at the word blameless last week, we unpacked it a bit. I mentioned it's the same word used of, of Zachariah and Elizabeth, the parents of John the Baptist, saying they were blameless before God in light of the law. And, and Paul said, if you do this, then you will also be blameless and pure in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, a crooked and warped generation. And, and that's the result we can look forward to. And Paul's writing to the Philippians. He's writing to them. They lived in a, in a Roman colony, a Roman city. They had many opportunities to compromise. It was a city that did not hold to God's standard of morality. And we don't need to look very far in our context to find corruption, depravity, and evil, do we? We have it all around us. We have it in our world. We have it everywhere in the world, really. But, but we are not in a very different situation from what they were. So he's warning them that you are in a crooked generation. And, and sometimes, you know, I, I, I read things, and sometimes I feel as Christians, you know, we, we look at, you know, what's happening around the world, we look at gay marriage, we, we, we look at certain things that we see happening, and we think, wow, you know, our culture is getting so bad that it's, it's worse than it's ever been. And, and it seems like a perpetual slide. But the only challenge I have with that is that every generation actually thinks that. You look back at what Plato said before Christ, and he said, this is, you know, children are disobedient, we're falling away from the morals we used to have. And this is, you know, more than 2,000 years ago. So it's easy to look at every generation and say, we're worse than we used to be. But I think just as they lived in a crooked generation, we do as well. I don't think there's any significant change. The Romans did some pretty messed up stuff. If you, if you go into the history of what they used to do. And we also live in a, in a challenging place. But that's what makes us stand out all the more. And that's why we shine like light in the sky. We shine like, star, sorry, like stars in the sky. And that's one of the ways we can translate what Paul is saying. And a star is bright because it's in darkness. You can't see stars during the day, can you? Because the sun is, is overwhelming. The light of the sun is so much more powerful. But at night, when it's dark, that's when you see them. And so for us, we shine brighter when we're in a darker place. And that's when we have the opportunity to stand out for God, to stand out for God, to hold His message wherever we go. And that's what Paul is telling the Philippians, that if they work out their salvation in fear and trembling, if they do everything with their grumbling and complaining, then they will be blameless, they will be pure, they will be light in the world. And the same is true for us. We can also live out that message today. So that's my summary of question one. The first thing that I look at in this course of explaining what any passage is saying. But then the, the, the second question we looked at, question two, was the question of how does this passage, these four verses, compare with the rest of the Bible, the larger picture of what God tells us through Scripture? And that's a good question to ask when you're looking at any passage. Some passages are very difficult to understand. And if we understand them on their own in isolation, we can come up with, with a warped theology, we can come up with an inaccurate application. So we need to always make sure that as we come up with what a passage is saying, it connects 
with the rest of the Bible. It doesn't contradict or go against what any other you know, Bible message or Bible passage is saying. And uh, I won't go into too much detail here. I'll just say that we know that the message of the Bible is that God desires all men to come to faith in Him. That the Bible begins with creation. It ends with the final glory, the end of time, and the, the judgment, and the new heavens and new earth coming, coming to us. And then all throughout, we see the story of the nation of Israel. We see the coming of the Messiah, of, of Jesus, as He came to earth to bring us salvation. And the, the growth of the church in the New Testament. That's the message of the Bible that we have. And so clearly, this passage, the way we understood it, is in line with God's desire that we see others come to faith. God's desire that we make disciples. And God's desire that we live by the Spirit. We live lives of purity. We live lives free from compromise. So the application, so, so the, the explanation you've come up with, the point you've identified, is not in conflict with, with the rest of the Bible. And question three is similar to that. It just asks it a little differently. And it says, how does this passage compare with other Bible passages? And the reason I ask it differently is sometimes, you know, we could be reading in Mark, and we see a passage that has the exact same story told in Matthew or in Luke. And it can be helpful to compare them. So we see the similarities, we see the differences. To compare scripture with scripture. So as well as looking at the overall theme, we also look at particular passages to see how they connect. And I'll, I'll just read out a few of us. I won't ask you to turn to them for the sake of time. But we have a number of passages that look at salvation. For example, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, Paul tells the Ephesian church, For by grace are you saved, not of works, it is a gift of God so that no one could boast. Which is similar to the message we're seeing here. We also have James, James 2.18, looking at faith and works. It says, show me your faith without works, and I will show you faith by my works. And these two passages show the both sides of the gift as well as the task that we have to have in salvation. And 1 Peter 4.11, I like this verse, and I feel it really illustrates what we're looking at here in Philippians. 1 Peter 4, 11. It says, Whoever serves, let him do it as one who serves by the strength that God supplies <coughs> in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. So I serve. That's the expectation here. And the expectation is that all of us would serve in different ways according to our gifting. But how do we serve? Through the strength that God supplies. So I'm not serving my own strength, I'm serving because of something that God has done. And so we, we see then that same thing, that the reason I can work out my salvation is that God has first worked it in me. The reason I can serve is that God has given me the strength in order to serve. So we have, again, that, um, that connection. I'll just read too briefly in James 5.9. It says, Do not grumble against one another. Brother, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. In Ephesians 4.29, Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that you may give grace to those who are So whenever you're going through a Bible study, and you want to do each step carefully, I would encourage you to look at passages that connect to the one that you're studying, to see how they may seem to contradict, or they may seem to add new information, or they may reaffirm you know, what the pastor is saying, so you can hold them together and you get a more accurate view. And the final question we're looking at today, before we wrap up, is question four. What general truths or theological, what general principles, theological truths, does this passage set out? And it's similar to question one. Question one, we're identifying the main point of this passage, but in question four, we're thinking a little more broadly of, of what's a principle I can identify from this passage that I can then apply broadly, I, I can apply in different situations. I think one principle we can identify from this is that salvation requires our effort, but is dependent on God's prior work. And I think we, we have that here. Salvation requires our effort, but is dependent on God's prior work. Well, that's a principle we can learn from this passage that we can apply in our lives. We, I, did, I mentioned earlier, you can't work out what God hasn't first worked in. And 
And that's another passage we can learn from this. Another principle, sorry, we can learn from this passage. Finally, one, one more is that being a Christian sets us apart. And that's what I see from the talk of being a light, the talk of being blameless. It distinguishes us. It sets us apart from those around us. So there's a lot more we could do. I mean, you know, there's a lot more verses I could have looked at for question three, other passages. There's, there's more principles I could have come up with. But I wanted to really give you an example so that when you look at a passage, you can follow the same progression. Last week we had um, given out these blue sheets, and we have them at the back, the table on the, the right as you go out. So if you'd like a summary of the steps that I've gone through, feel free to pick them up. We handed them out last week, but we still have a number that are available that summarizes how we read, understand, explain, and apply. And next week, we're going to come to the last week of this series, and we're going to look at our takeaway. And then we have the takeaway bag there that represents that. And technically, I know that's not a course of a meal, but for us, that's what you take home, and that's what you live out in our analogy of reading the Bible as a meal. And so next week, we're going to look at the application. We're going to look at how we can live out this passage and what it means for our day-to-day -day lives. And we're going to explore a few questions as we have in previous steps. We're going to explore a few. We're going to break it down a little bit. And I'll explain to you what I see in this passage, Philippians 2, that I believe we can live out in our day-to-day -day lives. So we'll, I, I'd ask you to, to rise to your feet as you prepare to close. We've got a, a, a little bit over time, so I'll, I'll stop there. And I'd encourage you to continue discussing this, to continue, even as you're in small groups, as you read the Bible together, to think through these steps and how you can try them out yourself. Because that's my desire. That's why we're doing this. So that all of us can read and study the Bible ourselves and do it with our friends so that we understand what it's saying and what it means. And so as we mentioned, we have our concert coming up at 2.30. We do have food available for sale, so we have a vendor who's come to provide us with lunch. So I encourage you to stick around if you can, to, to find something to eat, and, and we can enjoy the afternoon of worship together. I'd like to thank again Pastor Nick for coming, and Pastor Jenny for being here. And I'd like to close us in prayer as we prepare to, to finish our service, and just to encourage us that reading the Bible is possible, and that that's why God has given it to us. So let's go ahead and pray together. Dear God, I thank you for this day, and I thank you for the chance we have to go through your word, the chance we have to look at different ways that we can understand and, and apply it to our lives with God, that we can explain what it means as we think through what you're telling us, oh Lord. I thank you for the letter to the Philippians, and that even though we're living thousands of years later in a different context, a different culture, in a different, different city, that we can still learn truth from that, and we can still hear you speaking to us through this passage. I pray that you would be with us, even as we depart this place. I pray that the concert this afternoon would go well, that you would be honored by our praise, O oh Lord, that you would be honored by all that we do to worship and glorify you. I pray that you would be with our families, that you would sustain us and keep us. I pray that we'd be able to live out our jobs and our time in school, and, and our time with our neighbors, all those we interact with, in a way that reflects the commands you've given to us to live without grumbling, without complaining, and to honor you with our lives. So I thank you for your blessings. I pray that you would still sustain us and go before us, O oh God, and that you bless us as a church. And it's in your name that I pray. Amen. Amen. So let's share the words of the grace together and turn to your neighbor and, and share it with them. <coughs> Ready to go and now with the great.